This is a journey in America, a journey to four towns in the United States in a time of war. We begin where the colonies began, in what is now the state of Virginia. In 1607, settlers from England came through this bay on the Atlantic coast. They gave the places names from home, James River and Elizabeth River, Portsmouth and Norfolk. Today, Old Norfolk is a great naval base. The first settlers carried plain English names, Smith, Kendall, Newport, Gosnold, and Goodrich. Wesley Goodrich is the name of this machinist. Before the war, the Goodriches lived 50 miles from Norfolk in a six-room house. He came here to work in the Navy Yard, so the family had to live in a trailer until the government built emergency war homes for the thousands of workers who had flocked to the shipyards. These new houses looked something like the first houses which the settlers put up in the Old Dominion. And like the first settlements, they were incomplete. The schools had not been constructed. The children thought this was fine. Vanessa Goodrich and her brothers ran wild for a few days. The people got together to discuss the problem. Mrs. Goodrich had an idea. Why not start up the schools in a row of cottages? The people went to work. Even the kids couldn't keep out of it, though they knew their help meant the school would be open sooner. master had to find teachers. He found them right in the community. Many of the wives of the war workers had taught school back home. Within a week, the children were off the streets. They liked the new school. It was just like home, same kind of house. Within a few months, the Alexander Park School had the largest enrollment in the state of Virginia. It never occurred to the people of Alexander Park that they had done anything notable. Schooling, they said, is one thing that has to be made, even in wartime, especially in wartime, for building the future citizens of a better world is just as important as building the weapons which will win it and secure it. From the Virginia shore, if you went by boat, you would pass the coasts of North and South Carolina and Georgia you would sail through the subtropical waters of the Florida Strait to Alabama. This is the Deep South. Spanish explorers came here first, then the French in 1699, when Pierre Le Moyne established the colony of Fort Louis de la Mobile, now the city of Mobile. The old French colony lives on in the quiet, shady streets with their porches of iron lace. Later, Mobile was cotton queen of the world and took her ease amidst her miles of azaleas. But now she is at war. She builds cargo vessels and invasion barges. And to build them, thousands of workers poured in from every state in the Union. This old city of 80,000 souls had to find a place to live for over 200,000 people. Mobile did her best. She threw open her mansions. They became rooming houses with beds and cots. A warehouse became a dormitory for girls from the city of New York, from the mountains of Kentucky, from the prairies of Kansas who had come to take the places of men as welders and shipfitters. 
The newcomers spilled over into the county. Trailers from Michigan and Nebraska. They camped in tents and in hastily put together shacks. Even in old trolley cars adapted into homes. None of the modern conveniences. They had come here to build ships, and they lived as they had to live. Government housing agencies attacked the problem. First, thousands of emergency trailers were rushed to Mobile and set up in colonies where electricity and sanitation were provided. Then immense temporary dormitories for single men, and war houses for families. It is not enough. It can never be enough. But the workers are satisfied. The shipyards prove their satisfaction. From Mobile, every day, ships go down to the sea to carry freedom back to the lands from which its founders came. From Mobile, if you span the United States due north, you would come to the city of Detroit in the state of Michigan. A Frenchman, Antoine de la Cadillac, founded Detroit in 1701. In peacetime, the city made automobiles for the world. In wartime, it makes tanks and aircraft for the United Nations. This is the bomber factory at Willow Run. It works day and night. This is Kenneth Watson, chief inspector of final assembly. 40,000 new workers came to Willow Run in its first year, so some must live in trailers. Those who work by night must sleep by day. Kenneth Watson could never get used to his turn on night shift. Watson said, can't you keep those kids quiet? They have no place to play, she told him. So he decided to build them a playhouse. He called together the men of his union. In Detroit, lumber is needed for new war factories. But there were still some abandoned construction shacks lying around. They borrowed a truck from the union. Mrs. Watson officiated at the laying of the cornerstone. Each did his share. It wasn't exactly palatial. They can do a better job later on, when the nursery school and recreation project for the war workers gets underway. In the meantime, the children have a place of their own.
And for evenings, it has other uses. These Americans building the newest weapons of war have followed a tune from the days of the flintlock for getting things done. The words are, join hands and go to it. Heading west from Detroit, you would cross the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Nebraska, and Wyoming to the nation's spine, the Rocky Mountains. The train follows the Sunflower Trail set in 1847 by the Mormons. The city of Ogden in the state of Utah is a railway center where the transcontinental lines branch off for Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Seattle on the Pacific coast. Here is a vast supply depot for the war in the Pacific. Stores of material for the Army, Navy, and Air Forces. Arsenals and warehouses. There simply weren't enough people in this part of the state to man all these new enterprises. The Army yards were clogged with unloaded cars. Urgent cargoes were delayed while ships waited in the Pacific port. General Talbot sent Colonel Grice to make one more attempt to find help. There was Cache Valley, populated almost entirely by the descendants of the Mormon pioneers. The people were busy. Amos Griffin farmed. Moroni Danes was a clerk at Tingwall's store. H.C. Davis taught mathematics. But Sunday was different. Griffin played with his children at home. Bill England's print shop was closed while he pasted up photographs of his sons at the front. Moroni Danes just took it easy. The Sundays of the people of Cache Valley were like Sundays all over America, until the army asked for help. Colonel Grice met with the mayor, the town leaders, and the deans of the college. They formed a plan. Next Sunday at four in the morning, the school bus started to pick up the people of Cache Valley. From all over the valley, the buses came, carrying them to a special train provided by the railroad. From Logan, from Clarkston, from Brigham they came, giving up their day of rest to work for the army. The whole valley turned out. They unloaded 50 cars, 100 cars. Mary Stanley, typist. They stacked a quarter of a million shovels. Bill England, Amos Griffin, Maroney Danes. H.C. Davis, the mathematics teacher. They loaded iron for the army. They stored rope for the Navy. They serviced steamrollers for new airfields in the Solomon. They assembled urgent train loads for the waiting ships. Every Sunday, 10,000 man hours of labor. 
the stuff of war, checked in, headed out on schedule by the people of Cache Valley, Utah. Working for victory. Working for a better world. Like the people more than a thousand miles away in Detroit, Michigan, in Mobile, Alabama, in Norfolk, Virginia, in London, in Moscow, in Chongqing. <laughs>